Hello, and welcome to Module 23, Remedies and Arbitration. The remedies that we're reading about specifically relate to the Truth in Lending Act, which we talked about in the last module, although very similar schemes exist under most federal consumer protection statutes, such as ECOA, that we'll talk about in the next module, and um, you know, Regulation B, and some of the other uh, consumer protection statutes we've discussed. So our first case is good because it really um, gives us a chance to look at the statutory scheme for damages under the Truth in Lending Act. And in this case, we have a situation which um, you'll find is somewhat common, where a buyer of a product, uh, first of all, it seems there was some unhappiness with the product, but essentially they're complaining about the Truth in Lending disclosures and that a fee was put in the wrong place. And so one of the nuances of the Truth in Lending Act is that required fees are part of finance charge and optional third party items can be excluded. And it's very important that you get them in the right place. And apparently this uh, dealership was financing the sale and they did not. And so what's most interesting though about this case is that in this situation, the buyer is requesting two times the finance charge, which is over $24,000. And the lender is saying, uh, no, you only get $1,000. Um, and it really has to do with how do you read the statute, which is laid out in your case on page 875. But some of this goes to the fact that the statute has been amended. We talked about how much TILA has been amended. Um, and so initially, it had these statutory damages, which a statutory damage means that if you violate the statute, you get damages. You don't have to prove anything except the violation, which when you think of all the requirements in TILA, that 30 days, the more prominent, it's not that difficult um, to establish those violations. Um, and so in 1974, they actually added actual damages, which are the damages you actually suffer, and class action damages. In 1976, leasing was added in a separate part. Um, in 1995, there were provisions added to increase the penalties for violations related to real estate secured lending. And then in 2009, the CARD Act added even higher penalties for violations related to open-end credit. So there have been a lot of amendments to the statute. And so ultimately, what we see is that when you read the statute, it said that in an individual action, which is what Coons was, you would get twice the finance charge. So they asked for twice the finance charge. But then it said in a consumer lease, you would get, and you had to have something more complicated because leasing is more complicated, but not less than 100 or greater than 1,000 what the dealership was relying on. And then for open-end credit, you were going to get up to 2,000 um, when it's, uh, I'm sorry, when it's secured by a dwelling, whether or not. Um, and so this is the way it was. And when you read that, it seems pretty obvious. Now, what's interesting is that everyone somewhat seemed to agree, maybe, that this was probably an oversight on the part of Congress. But at the same time, it is exactly what the statute said, and shouldn't you get what the statute says? Well, as the case points out, and there were different uh, court decisions on this issue at various levels, but it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and you see a kind of complicated discussion of what's a subparagraph and what's a paragraph, but ultimately it was determined that because of the use of the word subparagraph and the intent of Congress and really the overall scheme, the $1,000 applied to one and two. Um, Justice Scalia, in his dissent, said, well, if Congress got it wrong, isn't it better to give this one guy $24,000 so that Congress fixes it? Um, but he was in the minority, so that is not the rule. And what's interesting is that essentially it reads this way today, that it's quite easy, I think, to think that an individual gets twice the amount of the finance charges, which is far more, typically, than the $2,000. You can see that the amounts have all been increased. 200 to 2,000, 500 to 5,000, 400 to 4,000, or class action, a million or 1% of the net worth. 
Now, to give you a sense of the entire statutory scheme, we're under the, the damages section here. And above the statutory damages, are there are also actual damages. Um, one of the issues with these types of violations is they can be either hard to prove actual damages or be very minor and not worth anyone's time to bring the suit. So the statutory damages are to, in a sense, encourage suits. And then to encourage suits even more, the next part of this statute provides for attorney's fees so that unlike the typical American rule, the consumer can get their attorney's fee paid for. Um, so it is definitely designed to be somewhat of a, a self-enforcing statute, I guess is the sense, and that it is written with damages that encourage lawsuits for minor violations. Um, and so this may give you a sense of why we see a number of lawsuits. If you bring a lawsuit, you're guaranteed, if you prevail, that is, to get something, your statutory damages, as well as your attorney's fees. And many of the violations can be obvious from the face of the contract. So to maybe keep fewer um, cases going through, the industry began to adopt arbitration provisions. Um, and so we see this was subject to a lot of litigation. It's somewhat calmed down now, but here we have a, a mobile home and we have a class action that's very typical in consumer litigation. And they're asserting claims under the Truth in Lending Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act to federal consumer protection um, statutes. And again, it had to do with how you're categorizing these finance charges, and whether or not they go as a required charge, part of the finance charge or optional. Um, but there had been an arbitration provision. And so the finance company says, you can't take us to court, we're going to arbitration. Traditionally, the companies like arbitration, a little bit cheaper, um, but the plaintiff says, well, this arbitration provision is not fair. And the argument is that they don't talk about who's going to pay for this. And arbitration can be far more expensive. If you go to court, there is a minor filing fee. If you go to arbitration, the filing fee tends to be hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. So a lot of upfront costs, of course, because our taxes pay for the court system, whereas arbitration is a private system paid for by the fees. And so the question is, is this fair and is it enforceable? <clears throat> Well, ultimately, in a split decision, the court found that as long as the rights can be vindicated, as long as they have sort of a, a place to go to get their, their redress and they can claim their statutory and actual damages in arbitration just the same as they can in court. And the fact that it doesn't say who is going to pay these costs, that does not make it unenforceable. And part of that is because we have a Federal Arbitration Act and we have these laws that basically say arbitration is favored. We don't want to clog up the court systems. And if individuals and companies can settle their disputes through private arbitration, that is viewed as a good thing. Now, if you read the case, you can see there's really quite a difference in views and, you know, arbitration and how fair it is. But this case that went up to the US Supreme Court did resolve the issue as to whether or not you could arbitrate claims under a statute that provided for class actions and provided for a private right of action and had all these damages. And the US Supreme Court, as I said, in a split decision said, yes, just because there's a private right of action, that doesn't mean you can't agree to arbitration. Of course, agree is a relative term, um, but in entering into the finance agreement, you have agreed to arbitration. And so the court upholds it. And as I said, the Federal Arbitration Act is relied upon largely to get to this place and the Ohio courts are really the same. If you wanna guess who is not the same, I'll give you one chance. If you guess California, you're right. Um, so, we do see a lot of actions challenging arbitration occurring in California.
because the plaintiffs do tend to be a lot more successful there. In Ohio, they usually don't get it anywhere. Anyway, this case was remanded and then it ends up in another dispute. So the next time it is being disputed, the question is, hey, this arbitration says that they can't participate in class action and that there can't be class arbitration. And TILA provides for class actions because it provides for class action damages. So clearly TILA envisions a class action. Um, and if you think about it, if you looked back at those um, statutory damages, you know, $100 to 1,000 for an individual and a million to 1% for a class action. So a class action, you could argue, plays a very important role in encouraging um, companies and banks to comply. So the question is, does this prohibition on class action relief make this provision unenforceable? And so on remand, this case said that it would be fine. But overall, we saw a real split. Some circuits said that it was unenforceable, that if the clause banned this type of class action under TILA or any other statute that expressly authorized class actions, then the arbitration provision, or at least the class um, the class ban, could not be enforced. So ultimately though, as we saw in our notes, it made it up to the US Supreme Court, but as you can see from the dates, it was over 10 years of decisions going in both directions. Um, and so it was really, um, it, I would have to say that it was an issue that no one was completely sure how it was going to come out. But we did see this, it was not in the, um, financial services area. It was in the uh, AT&T mobile phone decision. But the way that the case was decided, it was clear that the same would apply to uh, financial services. And so the law of the land is that a fair arbitration provision um, is enforceable and waiving class action as part of arbitration is not something that makes an arbitration provision unfair or unenforceable. So with that in mind, if you were to read sort of the various cases, you would come up with some good provisions, though, to avoid these challenges, or if you are challenged, to make it almost certain that you should prevail. And one, I don't think I completely have it, I don't have it written on here, would be that it's written in a way that's understandable. That's a big important part uh, if we're thinking of compliance we want to get all the right information across but we want to make it in a way that a consumer can understand it and another item that's very important is to give a consumer the right to opt out typically this will be 30 days from the initiation and so if you go look at any of the arbitration provisions that you see in your financial service contracts you will almost always find that somewhere in there, it tells you that within 30 days of entering into the contract, you can opt out. And that supports the idea that you agreed to it because you didn't take this option that you were given. Did you know you had that option? Well, look at it next time. Also from this case that we just discussed, explain who pays. And typically the creditor will agree to pay the upfront filing fees, or they will agree to pay the fees if the, upon request and showing a financial need. We have seen some plaintiff's attorneys filing, um, you know, just hundreds and hundreds of arbitration cases every day because the cost is somewhat expensive. Um, so it is sort of an interesting uh, turning of the tables. But addressing cost and having the creditor either agree to pay the fees or agree to consider paying the fees upon request is considered the best practices. Um, it's also typically written that either party may elect. So that it, again, stresses this idea of the parties agreeing and choosing, um, making the arbitration either occur remotely nowadays or at a location of convenience to the consumer. And there is the AAA Arbitration Association that has developed um, consumer protocols. So oftentimes in consumer, product, um, consumer products, they'll elect the consumer arbitration protocol because these are all designed to be fair. And so... By making sure that uh, provisions treat the consumer right and give the consumer 
um, kind of a fair shake, you make it almost certain that the arbitration provision will be enforced. And as this line of case law has developed, um, we see much better arbitration provisions than we did originally, and they are almost always being upheld. There, it is still a bit of a controversial area that I do have to say. And in fact, the Dodd-Frank Act actually um, banned pre-dispute mandatory arbitration for mortgages and opened in credit secured by a dwelling. So um, home equity lines of credit. And so what pre-dispute mandatory arbitration means is it's a kind of a take it or leave it. It's part of the initial agreement. You can always agree to arbitration at the time the dispute arises, but in a mortgage, it can't be part of the initial sort of agreement. Um, in 2017, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau adopted rules restricting pre-dispute arbitration in all consumer credit agreements. Um, but very shortly after that, the president signed a joint resolution passed by Congress that disapproved that rule. And if something is disapproved under the Congressional Review Act, the agency is prohibited from ever adopting a rule on that same topic. So because of that, uh, it really can't be done now by CFPB rule. Um, we do have though in the law a prohibition also on arbitration in credit agreements with members of the military and their dependents and those are active duty military. So arbitration, um, it's been kind of a hot issue although because of sort of these items that I just discussed, it's it's a little bit quieter now. I think it's a little bit more settled. In, in reality, when I do talk and work with banks, they all will say, um, you know, the best thing is not to go to court or to go to arbitration. It's just to settle your disputes one-on-one -on -one individually. Um, so, you know, that's always the goal. Uh, but we do continue to see arbitration used extensively, at least in the consumer credit agreements. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.